You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Vivian Blaine. Jose Ferrer. Sam Levine. Ken Murray. Margaret O'Brien. Gloria Swanson. Fran Warren. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So is America, the curtains of America. We're going to fill your parlor full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, how did Santa Claus treat you? I must tell you about one beautiful present I received. A new mink coat. <laughs> My best friend sent it to me. I bought it myself. <laughs> I saw it in the window. I liked it. I decided I simply must have it. I wrote out a check for $10,000 and took the coat with me. When I got home, I decided I'd been a little too extravagant. And so I sent it back. And what an odd coincidence. The coat got back to the store just as my check came back from the bank. <laughs> but Christmas is behind us now, and we have a show to do. Last week, on our Christmas program, one of our guest stars was Margaret O'Brien of the movies. She did so well, too well to suit me, <laughs> that she's with us again this week, a sort of Christmas hangover for me. I wish I could take an Anison and make her disappear. <laughs> But she's been held over by popular demand. Not mine, you understand. The child is too talented, much too talented. After all, a job is a job. I'm not trying to take your job, Miss Bankhead. Well, darling little Margaret O'Brien. I want to thank you, Miss Bankhead, for your lovely Christmas present. Oh, do you like it, darling? Oh, yes. It was sweet of you to send me a one-way railroad ticket to California. I thought I wrapped it nicely. Oh, it was super. It was what, dear? It was super. A chief, of course. But I'm not going back to California, Miss Bankhead. You're not? I'm going to stick right close to you. You are not. Because I've decided I want to be a great actress just like you are. Oh, darling, isn't she sweet? There's so much I can learn from you, Miss Bankhead. Oh, Margaret, you may call me Tallulah. Oh, may I? Thank you. So you want to be an actress, little Margaret? Yes, I do, big Tallulah. <laughs> you see, I think a person should have an ambition, a goal in life. For 13 years now, I've been drifting aimlessly. Of course, for the last seven years, I made a niche for myself in the movies. Yes, a seven-year niche. <laughs> and what did you do the first six years of your life? You're just a bum, I suppose. Yes, those were bad years. I was disorganized, confused, tortured. I couldn't decide whether I should be in the theater or the movies. Why, I became so nervous, I was eating two packs of chocolate cigarettes a day. Yes, I, I see you still have the chocolate stains on your index finger. And I'll bet you used to hit that pablum bottle pretty hard, too. But now I know that the theater is my real love. And you're the one I want to pattern myself after. Oh, isn't she sweet? To be an actress like you, acclaimed by the critics, applauded by the public, a magnetic, dynamic, electric personality, so lit up. Watch your language, child. <laughs> I mean, the way you walk out on the stage without any assistance. <laughs> That's acting, Mitchellula. That's black coffee, child. That's my ambition, to be a big star like you are. 
And then after I've had my success, and if I had to retire and wind up on radio like you did, <laughs> well, those are the chances a person has to take. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, how would you like a shot in the head? <laughs> Besides, Margaret, actresses never retire. They are always between plays. Between plays? Yes, remember that. And besides, Margaret, I must warn you, the theater is an exacting taskmaster. To become a fine actress, it will take you years. Oh, I don't care. I want to become a fine actress like you. Even it takes me years and years and years and years now, and years. Now, just a minute, just a minute. <laughs> I wonder where this child is getting her material. <laughs> Margaret, here's lesson number two. An actress is very sensitive about her age. But then I, I wouldn't expect you to understand that at the tender age of uh, 13. Um, 12 and a half. I want to be just as sensitive as you are. <laughs> oh, Margaret, you're just a child. Now, why are we standing here talking about the theater, such grown-up talk for a little girl? Now, let's talk about the holiday season. Now, let me tell you all about New Year's Eve. No, don't tell me all about New Year's Eve. Why don't you just tell me all about Eve? <laughs> so that's where she's been getting her material. Well, I'll put a stop to this. Meredith, Meredith Wilson. Yes, Miss Bankhead. I, uh, I want to thank you, Margaret, for that Christmas present. You're welcome. Of course, I have no plans to go to California right away. <laughs> What? Margaret sent me a one-way ticket to California, and it was very nicely wrapped, too. By the way, Miss Bankhead, thank you for your present. It was just what I needed, a box of Fragile. <laughs> Meredith, that was a five-piece set of cut cloths. There was more pieces than that when I got it. <laughs> and, well, I want to thank you, Meredith, for that darling scarf you sent me and that delightfully warm Christmas card you enclosed. 60% rayon, 40% wool. <laughs> how warm can you get? <laughs> well, now, darling, how about some music, Meredith? Well, sir, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> <laughs> This is the big week in football, the bowl games, you know. So I wrote a song from my home state university, Iowa. Oh, is Iowa in one of the bowl games? Well, not exactly. They might have had a chance, though. See, Iowa was just nosed out in a game with Ohio State, 83 to 21. <laughs> That's quite a nose. <laughs> well, Iowa just couldn't get going in that game. Every time we started setting up a play, somebody fumbled the ball, and we couldn't get to our next play. Always got caught between plays. I'm between plays, too, Meredith. What? <laughs> Never mind, Meredith. Let's hear the Iowa fight song you wrote for Iowa, but which is dedicated to all the teams who didn't get into any of the bowl games tomorrow, but who are going to, by golly, make it next year a bust. <laughs>
Meredith, that was really swell. You've got quite a band there. Ken Murray. <laughs> Hello, Tallulah. Tallulah, I was just listening to that Iowa fight song that Wilson wrote. Kind of brings back old memories to oh, me, Oh, really, darling? You went to college in Iowa, too? Oh, no, no. As a matter of fact, I didn't go to college at all. I, I don't believe a man has to go to college to get an education and acquire a polish. I'm proud to say that I learned all I know in the school of H.N. School of H.N.? Hard knocks. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have hurt you to have had a short spell in college, dear. Oh, no, no, not me, Tallulah. You see, I started in show business when I was a kid. Never had a chance to go to school, but I used to read books all the time. Right now, I've settled down here in New York, and I've got Dr. Elliott's five-foot bookshelf in my home. But do you read the books in the five-foot bookshelf? Oh, sure. I read about three inches every night. <laughs> My, you read quick. <laughs> yeah, I read that too. <laughs> we, uh, we all read in my family. I read, my dog reads, even my, my, uh, my wife, and even my dog reads. Your dog reads? Yes, yes. For Christmas, I got him a copy of Bulldog Drummond. <laughs> of course, he's just starting to read books now. When he was a puppy, we broke him in on newspapers. <laughs> But, Jalula, I came over here to your program for a very special reason. I'm not here to be entertaining. What makes you think you have been, darling? <laughs> I do a television program. How would you like to be a guest on my TV show? I would rather die. <laughs> what makes you think you won't, darling? Now, look here, crude cut. <laughs> I'm quite satisfied to be doing the show I'm doing here. But Tallulah, radio is old hat. But Ken, television is old movies. <laughs> Not on my show. I'd certainly like to have you on my television show with me, though. Oh, stop talking about it, darling. Whenever anyone mentions television to me, I see red. I'll pay you $5,000. All of a sudden, I see green. <laughs> Uh, tell me more about it, darling. Well, there are a few things you'll have to change. For uh -huh. instance, if, if you wanted to wear a black dress like you're wearing now, you'd have to wear a red dress because, you see, red photographs black, you see? Oh, I have a red dress. Uh, but what about my hair, darling? I'd wear that, too. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. You mean the color of your hair. I'm so sorry. Well, we had a girl on the show with hair just those same colors. But uh, to make it photograph better, we had to give her a blue rinse. <laughs> Boy, was she sore. Blue on top, huh? <laughs> uh, what, about, uh, what about makeup? I suppose makeup is a big factor. Oh, yes. Max, a big difference. <laughs> because, because otherwise, you see, you don't photograph with the right coloring. You see... And then, of course, I'll have to give you some jokes to tell. I suppose the jokes will photograph blue. Oh, Ken, I'm sorry I forgot. I want to introduce you to my protege, my new protege. She decided she wants to become a great actress in the theater, and she's trying to pattern herself after me. Come here, Margaret, sweetie. Margaret O'Brien, this is Mr. Murray. Hello, Arthur. <laughs> Shall we dance? <laughs> She sure is pattering herself after you, Tallulah. So uh, you want to act in the theater, Margaret. Uh, how old are you? Um, Twelve. That's my girl who said that. <laughs> Ken, why don't you put Margaret on your show? Well, I'd like to, but uh, don't you think that she's a little Y-U-N-G? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have Y-O-U on my T-E-L-O. I mean, my T-O-L-I. How do you spell television? <laughs> Darling, when I go on television, it'll be spelled T-A-L-L-U, V-I-S-I-O-N. Oh, Tallulah Vision, huh? I've made up my mind to be in the theater like Tallulah. Oh, what are you doing now, Margaret? I'm between plays. Oh, you've already been in some plays? No, she's between her first play. <laughs> well, uh, have you seen any of the plays since you've been in town, Margaret? Oh, yes, I went to sing King Lear by Shakespeare. <laughs> That's a lot of laughs. And I good. saw the, the cocktail party by T.S. Eliot. Good man, T.S. I've, I've got his five-foot bookshelf, you know. <laughs> and I saw Enemy of the People. Starring Milton Berle, I suppose. <laughs> Laughter 
look, look, Margaret. Didn't you go to see uh, any of the lighter things? Some musical comedies, maybe? Oh, no. I wouldn't go to musical comedies. They're so cheap, and the prices are so high, and besides, I couldn't get any tickets. <laughs> You're right, Margaret. I wanted to see one of the musicals this week. I know the star of the show very well. She happens to be a personal enemy of mine. <laughs> so I went to the producer, and I asked him for a pair of tickets. And do you know that I couldn't get them for love? Our money. Uh, Jalula, I've got a ticket broker who gets all the tickets to the theaters for me. He, he got me a couple for guys or dolls. Uh, guys and dolls, I think that is. Of course, I had to send him a nice Christmas present. No, oh, well, speaking of guys and dolls, we happen to have two of the stars of that show with us today. Vivian Blaine and Sam Levine. And after Vivian sings her song, Margaret, you, you ask her for a couple of tickets. I'm sure she has them. Meredith, darling. Darling Meredith, are you ready for Vivian Blaine's song? Oh, sure. All set. Uh, hiya, Meredith. Hello, Ken Murray. <laughs> well, as I always say, long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do always say that, and that's why no long time no see. <laughs> Meredith, <laughs> I want to thank you for your Christmas present. Oh, you're welcome, Ken. I wrapped it up pretty nicely, didn't you think? Yes, I'm very sorry I can't use it. I don't sleep well on trains. <laughs> you uh, don't mind, I'm sure, I gave it to somebody for a Christmas present? That one-way ticket is making a round trip. <laughs> Meredith, what is Vivian Blaine going to sing, huh? Well, uh, Vivian has a wonderful arrangement of what is this thing called love. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, Vivian Blaine with Meredith Wilson's orchestra and chorus in... What is this thing called love? What is this thing? Congratulations, not only for your song, but for the enormous success you've made in Guys and Dolls. Thank you very much. You're very kind, Tallulah. Yes, I know. 
Now, look, Vivian, little Margaret here is interested in the story of your musical comedy. Why don't you tell her what it's all about? Oh, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. We're not allowed to give away the plot. Oh, you can't even give it away. <laughs> <laughs> You're so wrong, Tallulah. We're selling out every performance. I got in on a couple of passes. <laughs> yes, that's what I heard. The manager made one, and the box office man made one. <laughs> <laughs> You're just jealous because you can't get any tickets and you're in the show. It just so happens, Tallulah, darling, that I have two very good seats with me. Yes, you have, darling. <laughs> and it might interest you to know that when I saw your show, I was sitting in the very front row. I'm sure you must have seen me. Oh, no. I never look way up there. <laughs> and now, just a moment. Why is it that everyone who comes on this show starts picking on me? <laughs> I try to be as pleasant oh, as I Oh, excuse me, Tallulah. Uh, what is it, Margaret? <laughs> Let me, please. Hello, Vivian. Darling. <laughs> Why, Margaret O'Brien, hello. Golly, I haven't seen you in years. Remember when I met you out in Hollywood when I was making pictures? Why, well, you remember. You must have seen me in State Fair. Oh, yes, darling. You won a blue ribbon for that, didn't you? <laughs> That's my girl who said that. <laughs> well, that's a new twist. Hiring a little girl to insult your guests. Oh, no, Vivian. Margaret didn't really mean it. She, she's just trying to help me out. She's very, very interested in seeing your play. Now, you said you had a couple of tickets. Why, yes, indeed I have. I'll be glad to give them to oh, her. Oh, wonderful, darling. I, I hope she'll be able to understand it. The show is quite adult, I hear. Uh, how old are you now, Margaret? Uh, Eleven. Oh. <laughs> Why, she'll be able to understand it, because by the time she can use these tickets, she'll be 15. You have tickets four years in advance. Why not? Every night there's a sign in front of the box office that says SRO, standing room only. So what? When I was in private life, we had the SRO sign in the box office, too. Yes, it was SRO. Six rows only. Just a minute, just a minute. If you two dolls will excuse me. Sam Levine. I've been standing here listening to you two bro... You two, uh, <laughs> dolls beating each other's brains out. This one says she's got two seats. That one says, why don't you try standing room? The other one says it won a blue ribbon. So enough already. Now, what does this kid want, this little Miss Mark O'Brien? All she wants, darling, is to buy two tickets to your show. That's all. Hmm? For this, we went through this hoo-ha and mishmash with Vivian. <laughs> Stop tumbling. Two tickets to guys and dolls can be arranged. Oh, do you mean you have two tickets? Well, not with me. Who carries that much cash? <laughs> what do you mean you know where you can get a pair of tickets? What a question to ask Sam Levine. Now, I'd like to ask you a question for your own information. Who has been on Broadway longer than I have? Oh, I'm sorry. That's an unfair question to ask you. Uh, Mr. Levine, uh, what is the point besides the one your hat is on? Uh -huh. Oh, you're going to start again with the two seats, huh? Look, Tallulah, what I'm trying to point out to one and all is that I happen to have connections with a certain highly placed gentleman who can put, a, uh, put their dukes on a pair of ducats for a friend any time. And I happen to be that friend. All that it takes is a telephone call. I know the right people. I happen to be the star of the biggest hit on Broadway. And I have plenty of influence. So show me the telephone and give me a slug. Don't tempt me. Huh? <laughs> Sammy, you won't need a slug. Just pick up any phone here and make your call. This is NBC. They have thousands of telephones. Thousands of phones? What a location for a bookie. <laughs> oh, when you stop to think how unfair life can be. I got a friend, Benny the Book, has one lousy telephone. They came and they tore it out by the roots. And besides, they arrested him. Oh, did they send him up the river? No, it was his first offense. He's just up the creek. <laughs> Sam, you were going to make a phone call. Here, use this one. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure he'll be in. This is Sunday. They don't run anywhere on Sunday. Sam, you're not calling a horse player to get tickets to your show. Why not? He's a mutual friend of mine. A two-dollar mutual uh, friend of yours. Well, I haven't seen him in months. The last time I saw him was, uh, let's see, 
May, June, July, Saratoga, September. Uh, oh, hello, Marvin. Oh, Irving. Oh, Marvin ain't there. Irving, this is Sam. Could you ask Joey to run across the street to Manny, Max, and Eddie's and ask Sal to send Marvin to the phone? <laughs> yeah, tell him it's Sam Levine. Sam Levine, the actor. All right, Sam Levine, the bum. <laughs> what? Just for going across the street? Okay, I'll stand good for it. Go call him. Look, Sam, if you're going to call every Tom, Dick, and Harry in town... Who called Tom, Dick, and Harry? I called for Marvin, and Irving said he would send Joey to Manny Maxinetti's. All right, already. Let's get the tickets. <laughs> okay, so Joey went to call Marvin. It's a person-to-person call. I would make the tickets cost $5 extra. What's the $5 for? Well, you can't expect Joey to walk across the street for nothing. He only makes two fifty dollars on it. The other two fifty dollars is for the premium for the accident insurance in case while he's crossing the street he should get knocked down by an automobile. What am I doing in radio? I could get myself a pair of track shoes and I'm in business. Look, Tolulu, I'm doing this for you out of the goodness of my heart. Plus a small fee for incidentals. I wouldn't get tickets for anybody else in the world, but for you, I'm going to this trouble. Well, if I'd known you had to put so many men on the job, I wouldn't have asked you. How long is it going to take? It'll take only long enough for Joey to get Marvin and then to come to the phone. Well, Joey should be back by now. Well, look, figure it out. First, he's got to shave. <laughs> then he's got to put on a shirt and a tie. Shave to go to Manny, Max, and Eddie's? What is it? One of those fancy restaurants... Well, you can't eat unless you wear a tie. At Manny, Max, and Eddie's, you cannot eat at any time. It's an auto supply store. Uh, a formal auto supply store. You have to dress. Well, they run a little handbook in the back. And they could get raided at any minute. So how would Joey look in the lineup without a shave and a tie? Ghastly, I'm sure. By the way, I should mention, in case they are raided... There'll be an extra $500 added to the tickets. Bail. Margaret, darling, won't you reconsider that one-way ticket to California? Yes, maybe it would be cheaper. Meredith, can you give me that railroad ticket back? Gee, I'd like to, Margaret, but I gave it to Ken Murray. Hey, Ken, if you're not going to use that railroad ticket, I... Oh, I'm sorry, Meredith, but I gave the ticket away to somebody who did me a favor. Maybe I could get it back for you if I can use the phone. Hello, Marvin. Oh, Joey, so where's Marvin? Look. I want you should get me right away a couple of tickets to Guys and Dolls. All right, Guys and Dolls. So where's Marvin? He left town. Somebody gave him a Christmas present. A one-way ticket to California. Oh, fine. Well, Tallulah, I tried and I failed. Now, there's only one thing left to do. Here, I'll give you these two tickets that I got in my pocket for tomorrow night. Oh, Sam, do you mean that you had those tickets in your pocket all the time? Yeah, go ahead, take them. I'll let you have them for cost, $40. $40 for a pair of theater tickets? Well, I'd rather wait till your scalper friend Marvin gets back. And I can get them from him for less than that. To Lulu, don't be a schlemiel. Where do you think Marvin gets his tickets from? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus. We'll be back in a moment, darlings, just as soon as I ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. 
The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, and by the makers of Anacin, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. The big stars on this program are Vivian Blaine, Jose Ferrer, Sam Levine, Ken Murray, Margaret O'Brien, Gloria Swanson, Fran Warren, Meredith Wilson, and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus, and every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable, Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, in a few hours, 1951 will be here. I've devoted this entire day to thinking of the things I've done this past year that I shouldn't have. And I've come up with the most darling resolutions. I can hardly wait till midnight to start breaking them. <laughs> Meanwhile, our show goes on, and one of our guests, little Margaret O'Brien, keeps tagging after me because she's made up her mind she wants to be an actress in the theater. Just like I am. I, I feel as if I'm her fairy grandmother. <laughs> that should be godmother. <laughs> that misprint was deliberate. Oh, Tallulah. Yes, Margaret, darling. I just saw Gloria Swanson and Jose Ferrer come into the studio. Yes, Margaret, yes, darling. They're going to do a scene later in the program... From 20th Century, the play they're starring in on Broadway now. It's, um, it's a drawing room comedy. What's a drawing room comedy? Uh, well, uh, drawing room comedy is... Uh, well, it's usually a play where a lot of rich people pay six sixty to see a lot of poor actors acting like a lot of rich people. <laughs> Gee, it must be wonderful to be in a play on Broadway. I wish I was as great an actress as Gloria Swanson. I beg your pardon, child. <laughs> How about me? Oh, I mean you, too. I wish we both were as great an actress as Gloria <laughs> Darling, I love Gloria no one better. Why, we are very dear friends. But this is her very first play on Broadway. I've been in dozens of plays. Oh, I know. I know them all. And what fun you must have had in them. Private Lives, The Little Foxes, Skin of Our Teeth, Dark Victory, Rain, Reflected Glory... Mr. Roberts? Mom! <laughs> I was never in Mr. Roberts. That's a play with all men in it. I know, but... But wouldn't it be fun? <laughs> Why? Miss O'Brien, when I was your age, I never... Uh, oh, well, uh, what were you saying, darling? <laughs> I was just thinking how wonderful it would be to be a big star in the theater and have your pictures in all the papers and the magazines... I once saw your picture on the cover of Life magazine. Uh, How did you ever get them to put your picture on the cover of Life? Uh, well, someday, darling, I'll explain the facts of life. <laughs> oh, I've been meaning to ask you. Can I have your autograph? Why, of course, dear child. Would you write it on these three pieces of paper? Well, an autograph and triplicate, I am honored. I need three because the kids outside the theater told me that for three Tallulah Bankheads, you can get one Gloria Swanson. <laughs> I was just stabbed. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean what you think. I, I meant what I said. I mean, I meant because everybody wants your autograph. That's why I'd like three of them. And very few people want Gloria Swanson's. You see? Does that sound better? Uh, darling... Have you ever thought of giving up the theater and becoming a surgeon? <laughs> you put that knife in so gently. Hey, Tallulah. Yes, Ken Murray? I, I just saw Gloria Swanson and Jose Ferrer come into the studio. Yeah, so I've been told. Gee, that Gloria Swanson, she sure looks young for her age, doesn't she? I look younger for my age than she does for her age. <laughs> Gad, I did it. I knew it would happen. I finally insulted myself. <laughs> Wait a minute, Tallulah. Now, wait a minute. Let me figure that thing out. Now, if you say that you're younger for your age than she is for her age, then that makes you older age for age. Is no, that no. it? What I meant is that I'm younger for the age I say I am than she is for the age she really is. 
And that's older than the age she says she is, or the age I really am. Yes. Would you mind repeating that question? And well, what I'm trying to explain, Ken, is you say she looks young for her age, mm. and I said that I'm younger for the age I say I am mm. than she is for the age she really is, which is older than the age she says she is, which is older than the age I really am. <laughs> How many witches were in that sentence? <laughs> Only two. Ken, may I ask you a question? Why, yes, Margaret. Why do you always hold that cigar when you're on stage? Oh, I don't know. It's an old habit, sort of puts me at ease. Here, have one. Try it. Thank you. Hello, Tallulah. Well, Fran Warren, darling. Say, you know who I just saw backstage? Gloria Swanson and Jose Ferrer. She looks so young for her age, doesn't she? He looks pretty young for her age, too, darling. <laughs> and Fran, may I say that you look divine for your age, whatever it is. What are you going to sing for, sweetie pie? I've got the right to sing the blues. At her age, look who's got a right to sing the blues. Go ahead, darling, sing it. Here's a word from RCA Victor. As we look ahead to the gigantic tasks our country must perform in 1951, it's clear that every individual's working life is going to be busier and more complicated than ever before. We're all going to need recreation in our home lives to erase the cares of each long day and recharge our batteries for the next one. That's where television fits in perfectly. And now is the time to see your RCA Victor dealer and choose from 18 beautiful models, each one seemingly more beautiful than the next. You'd do well to choose a 19-inch set 
for pictures that are wonderfully clear and big. Of course, they'll have that matchless quality which has made RCA Victor million-proof television far and away America's favorite. Here's wishing you RCA Victor Television, and with it, the high morale which will help so much to make 1951 a happier year for everyone. You know, darlings, the holiday season is traditionally a time of extraordinary excitement in the theater. But these holidays brought us a little more than the ordinary extraordinary. Anta, meaning American National Theater and Academy, marked a red-letter day in its worthy history when it presented Gloria Swanson, Jose Ferrer, and an all-star cast in Mr. Ferrer's revival of that famous hit play of the 1931-32 season, 20th century. So tremendous has been the public response that the play is moving over to the Fulton Theater for an extended run. We'll give you a taste of the kind of evening you can look forward to at the Fulton by presenting now a scene from the play starring Miss Swanson and Mr. Ferrer. Ladies and gentlemen, the curtain is up on 20th century. This is the story of an eccentric Broadway producer named Oscar Jaffe and his meal ticket, a glamorous bundle of talent and temperament, Lily Garland. This is the story of an overnight train trip on the 20th Century Limited from Chicago to New York. We are several hours east of Toledo, Ohio, as the scene opens. Lily, played by Miss Gloria Swanson, feigns sleep in her apartment. Sadie, the watchful maid, is not at all surprised when the door opens and Oscar Jaffe, played by Mr. Jose Ferrer, reconnoitres the situation. Not a word, Sadie. We must not wake her. Poor child, nobody understands her. She's very delicate. If you don't mind, I'll just sit here for a moment and breathe the air that surrounds her, look at her little possessions, and remember things... Sadie, who's in there? No, oh, I'm sorry I woke you up. So it's you. You sneaked in while I was asleep. What do you want, scorpion? If it makes you any happier to call me names, go right ahead. Oscar, you're complete. You're the most horrible excuse for a human being that ever walked on two legs. You've always misunderstood me, Lily. You lack the true intuitive gifts to appreciate great love. Your philosophy of love doesn't interest me, Mr. Jaffe. I'm an oriental, Lily. Love blinded me. That was always the trouble between us as producer and artist. Oh, so that's what it was, was it? How about your name in electric lights bigger than everybody's? Your grand illusions that you are a Shakespeare and Napoleon and the Grand Lama of Tibet all rolled into one. You're absolutely right. What? I'm big enough to admit it. I never appreciated your real greatness until I lost you. Why, that last quibble we had about percentages, gad, how small, how cheap I was. What egotism, not to know that it was Lily Garland and not Oscar Jaffe. Running mattered. all over town telling people that you had to put chalk marks on the stage so that I'd know where to stand. Uh, that you had to teach me to talk like a parrot. God, it was despicable. I could cut my throat. But I've paid for it a thousand times since. When I saw that last movie of yours, I only blamed myself. Oh, you've seen it, eh? Well, you'll be glad to know that it's a tremendous success. Oh, I'm marvelous in it. Superb. Don't say that, Lily, please. Well, don't here, if you don't believe me, look at this. Now, where did you get this dreadful thing? For bowling? Well, read what it says. The Academy of Motion Picture <laughs> Arts and Sciences. <laughs> it's pathetic, isn't it? Don't fall for this sort of thing, Lily. There were moments in the film when you were marvelous. Yes, they couldn't stop the real Lily from coming through several times. But that cheap story, that clumsy, unimaginative director... Well, he must have been related to the bank. Well, you're right there. And you want to know why? The director was an idiot. I couldn't get anything into his head. I had to fight him all the time. It was sacrilege to throw you away on a man like that. I wouldn't have him for my office boy. And the lighting in that picture. Don't you remember how I always brought the lights up every time you stepped on the stage? You became a radiant creature to the audience. 
people left the theater feeling that they had gone through some great spiritual experience. I left that movie house feeling that some magnificent ruby had been set in a platter of lard. You put yourself back ten years, Lily, but we can mend that. You'll be greater than ever. Listen, Oscar, if all this adage is by any chance preliminary to a contract, you can save your breath because Who's I'm not Who said anything about contracts? Shame oh, on you, Lily. What are you talking about? You'd do anything to get my name on a contract. This, this billiard <laughs> trophy, this obscene lead statue must be doing things to you. <laughs> I didn't come in here with contracts. I came with a dream we both had long ago. The thing we planned as a climax to your career. The last golden stair. Look out. The courtesan. The great courtesan role. Oh, look out. Oh, no. So this is a big surprise you have for me. Another part where I'm unworthy of the lieutenant's love and make the great sacrifice. I wouldn't sneer if I were you. All right, what is it this time? Montezuma again or that big drama about Hepin Annie, the pride of the gas house? No, Lily, it's none of these things. This happens to be the greatest woman of all times. Just her memory has kept the world weeping for centuries. The Magdalene. Magdalene who? Now, you listen to me, Lily Garland. I'm going to put on the passion play in New York with Lily Garland as Mary Magdalene. I've had it up my sleeve all this time, waiting for the right moment. The wickedest woman of her age, sensual, heartless, and beautiful, corrupting everything she touches, running the gamut from the gutter to glory. Can't you see her, Lily? This little wanton reduced to helplessness, standing in the street, sobbing and wet through with her own tears. I'm going to have Pontius Pilate ride by in a chariot and I'm going to splash mud all over her. No, 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 wait. A pilot sees me. He does a take. Yes, yes. His horse, his horse uh, bolts. And Pontius is thrown out on his feet with a broken neck. Oh, and I smile through my tears. Lily, that's an inspiration. Go on while you're in the creative mood. Well... I'll tell you how I see the whole thing. I can see the Magdalene as a woman who was an aristocrat at the beginning. Yes. And after being brokenhearted by some man she loved madly and trusted, she went down, down, down. Into the dead. Hating and despising all men, laughing at them so cruel, so terribly cruel. Yes, Lily, I'm going to make it my greatest production, gamble every penny on it. I've brought over an entire troupe from Europe, smuggled them across the Alps right through four iron curtains. It cost me my shirt, but I wanted them. Two of them are geniuses. No, wait a minute, Oscar. Lily, if the play runs for five years, I won't make a dollar. You can have all the money. I only want to stagger New York. A desert scene with a hundred camels and real sand brought over from the Holy Land. <laughs> I'm going to have a Babylonian banquet that you give for your lover in the second act. The governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, with your slaves all around you. You're covered with emeralds in that scene from head to foot. But that's nothing to the finish, where you stand in rags. Rags? In rags, and the Emperor Nero himself offers you half his empire. You answer him with a speech that is probably the greatest piece of literature ever written, transfigured with love and sacrifice, and all the lights just pouring down on you. Nero cringes. And the last we see of you is this little pathetic figure selling olives in the marketplace. <laughs> Lily, it's sublime. Tell me, have I reached the artist in you? <laughs> what is it? You're crazy. What do you mean? He goes, listen to you, Oscar. You're a pure case of leaping paranoia. Lily. No, I am not angry. You're too funny to make anybody angry. Don't be cheap, Lily. Coming in here with a lot of camels and real sand from the Holy Land, you're to scream. You're going to put on the passion play. Oh, you have a hundred dollars to your name. I can raise millions, millions. Yes, and I know how you intend to raise them. Get my name on a contract and go out peddling it. Shake down some new angel on the strength of my reputation. Well, no, thank you. I'm through being your meal ticket. You're at liberty to call up any one of my banks in the morning. Your banks? You mean the ones that are taking your theaters away from you? That's a lie. You've been listening to my enemy. I've been listening to Mr. Oliver Webb, your so-called business manager who broke in here with a sob story about that you were going to commit suicide unless I took pity on you. Well, you go on and commit it. It would be a blessing to all concerned. Lily, what in heaven's name are you talking about? Mr. Webb is no longer with me. I fired him for stealing. Oh, shut up. I've had enough of your lies. Listen to me. I'm offering you your one last chance to become immortal. Thank you, but I've decided to stay mortal with a responsible management. Max Jacobs. <gasps> I can't believe it. No, oh, read the papers in the morning, then. Max Jacobs? He's got paresis. I had to fire him to protect the health of my office force. He's a thief besides. 
Illiterate. He can hardly write his name. He writes them on checks, all right, and great big checks, too. Oh, it's money you want. That's what you want. Just another oh, Broadway God. hand. That's what you've become. I suppose if I jingle the miserable ten or fifteen thousand dollars in front of your nose, your mouth would begin uh, to water. You'd start drooling and squealing. Gimme, gimme, That's gimme, right, Oscar. Gimme. Now get out of here before I have the porter thrown off the train. Look out who gets thrown off the train. Get out of here, you fake, you swindler, you. Oh, hit me, you cheap little shop Get girl. out before I call the conductor. Go on, ring that bell. I'll tell the world who's a fake. You are. I made you. I taught you everything you know. Your voice, your walk, your cheap little talents. They are mine. I gave them to you. I gave up everything to breathe them into you. Even your name, Lily Garland. I gave you that. Porter Sadie, conductor! Well, as sure as there's a God in heaven, Mildred Platka, you'll wind up where you belong. In burlesque. You, you love! Bring them on. I'll tell the whole train. I'll tell the whole world. Mildred Platka! Conductor, conductor, throw this man out. Throw him off the train! <laughs> Gloria and Jose. Come here, darling. Come over here. That was such fun. That excerpt from your brilliant production of 20th Century. Gee, thanks, Tallulah. I find it a lot of fun working in the theater, Tallulah. I bet you do. And Jose, you directed the play for Broadway, didn't you? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh... Oh, I read the wonderful notices the critics gave you. Yes, they certainly were. Yeah, not but... only for your direction, but for your acting. Well, they were all. And I understand the theater is selling out, which should make you very happy. Well, of course. Oh, uh... darling, I know you'd like to go on and just for hours telling us how wonderful your play is, but I simply must interrupt you. Well, if you'd only give me a chance to say something, then you could interrupt me. <laughs> oh, well, of course, darling. Go right ahead. Well, all I wanted to say was that I'd like to go up to my dressing room and change my shirt. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, why, of course, darling. Go right ahead. You're ringing wet. That's it, right through there, darling. You gave a wonderful performance. You were superb and so beautifully directed. See you later, darling. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> well, Gloria, Gloria, it's so nice to have a motion picture star on the program who isn't here just to plug some picture she just made. Your picture was such an enormous success, darling, that it doesn't need any plug. Well, what's the news from out in Hollywood? You mean, uh, what's new along Sunset Boulevard? <laughs> you slipped one in, didn't you, darling? <laughs> well, let's forget business and just, just talk some old-fashioned girl talk. Uh, just between the two of us. Mm. Yes, a girl talk just between the three of us. Oh, Margaret. I forgot all about you. Oh, Gloria, you know Margaret O'Brien, of oh, course. Uh, yes, hello, Margaret. Hello, Gloria, darling. Uh, Margaret is going to become an actress in the theater. Isn't that sweet? Mm. Well, Gloria, I bet you must be exhausted from working in a theater. Oh, here, sweet, have a cigarette. Uh, no, thank you, Tallulah. I don't care for one now. Uh, have a cigar, darling. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Margaret, darling. Cigar? <laughs> oh, I just carry it to put me at my ease. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gloria, I was in Hollywood, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. I saw everybody, and everybody was talking Dick's about... Navy, I'll chase. Well, everybody was talking about you-know-who. Oh, yes. He's been uh, behaving terribly, I hear. Oh, dear, terribly. He had the effrontery to come to the studio with the... What's her name? With what's her name? Where was her husband? Well, darling, he was driving that blonde who's it down to Palm, or what's your, what's your call it? <laughs> Tallulah, no. You don't say, darling. Margaret, sweet, you don't know what we're talking about. Oh, yes, I do. I've heard this story before. What? <laughs> This is the first time I heard the details. Well, may I ask, did you hear this story? Oh, from some of the kids on the lot. Dean Stockwell, Lionel Barrymore. That kid Lionel is incorrigible. I'm going to tell his kid sister Ethel about it. Oh, Tallulah, I almost forgot, and I, I don't know whether I should mention this or not, but I just read in the paper... Where that certain friend of yours got that wonderful award for the best motion picture performance of the year for the Critics' Circle. Which mm. proves what I've always suspected. The Critics' Circle is a bunch of squares. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't you agree, darling? Well, I'd like to, but I might want to make another picture in another 20 years. <laughs> Well, now, what was the matter with the picture you made, that, uh, that uh, Sunset Street? 
I thought it was brilliant. It's Sunset Boulevard, Tallulah. Oh. Well, I saw it in the neighborhood theater. <laughs> Well, whatever it was called, it certainly deserved the award because the same thing, you know, happened to me a few years ago when I made a magnificent picture. Oh, yes, I saw it. Lifesaver, wasn't it? <laughs> you were superb. A lifeboat, darling. Well, whatever flavor it was, I, I thought you gave the outstanding performance of the year. Ladies, if I may say a word. Oh, you back, Jose. Uh, speaking of great pictures, you're forgetting a picture that I made this year, Cyrano de Bergerac. Darling, don't stick your nose into this argument. Well, I made a picture once called Journey for Margaret, and I thought it would win the Critics' Award. And when it didn't, did I write them a nasty letter? This child will someday grow up to be the President of the United States. <laughs> If you would like to know a quick, easy way to ease the pain of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, then by all means, try Anacin. Your own dentist or physician may at one time or another have handed you an envelope containing Anacin tablets. Then you already know how incredibly fast and effectively Anacin brings relief. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. For your own sake, try Anison. Anison is sold to you on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want as fast as you want it, you may return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison tablets at any drug counter. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Jose, I want you to have a little talk with Margaret O'Brien. She's so interested in becoming an actress in the theater, and I really don't know of a more expert artist she can come to for advice. Well, that's quite flattering, Tallulah. I'd appreciate any help you can give me, Mr. Ferrer. I know the child is quite young. Nonsense. One of the greatest parts ever written was for a young girl, because the character was supposed to have been 14 years old. I'm referring, of course, to Juliet, of the immortal Romeo and Juliet. Uh, how old are you, child? Oh, uh, I just turned 14. <laughs> you know, you might well play it at that. Oh, this little girl played Juliet Jose. Some of the greatest actresses of the theater played it. Jane Cowell, Judy Marlowe, Catherine Cornell, Miss Ethel Barrymore. I know, Tallulah, but I've always thought it would be interesting to have the 14-year-old Juliet played by a 14-year-old actress. I wonder if you would read a scene with me, Margaret, uh, the famous balcony scene. Oh, may I? Jose, are you mad? Now, how can a 14-year-old child run the gamut of emotion necessary to portray the exacting role of a girl torn from the arms of the man she loves, frustrated at every turn by parents who finally drive the lover to their destruction... What could this child possibly know about love? Why, when I was 14 years old, I never... I, uh, <clears throat> Margaret, maybe you'd better try to play it, dear. Oh, excuse me, Tallulah. Before Mr. Ferrer and Miss O'Brien appear as Romeo and Juliet, I wish to say that this portion of the program was brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, and by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. Now, Tallulah, will you ring your chime? <laughs> this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is The Big Show. And Margaret O'Brien, one of the guest stars, is about to realize her lifelong ambition to become an actress in the legitimate theater. All right, everybody, on stage, a star is about to be born. I want you all to watch this, Vivian Blaine. What's going on? Jose Ferrer is going to act out a beautiful scene with Margaret O'Brien. That guy is going to act with that little doll? Vivian, what is this guys and dolls talk? You mean that you don't know what a guy is and what a doll is from the play of the same name where I talk like this? No, I don't know what a guy is and a doll is from the play of the same name where you talk like that, darling. Well, listen to me. I'll be glad to explain you. Uh, darling, they've been trying to explain me for years. <laughs> well, Tallulah, darling, I'll explain you very simple. Do you ever go to Lindy's for a bite? If I'm going to be bitten, I'd rather be bitten at the store club. 
What I mean is, do you ever go to eat at Lindy? No, I rarely dress for dinner. <laughs> yeah? From this, a person can catch a cold. Well, what about Lindy's? Well, we'll say, for instance, Lindy is packed to the gills. It is impossible physically, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, to squeeze, <laughs> if you'll pardon the expression, <laughs> another patient. But at one table for four are sitting two fellas, and the other two seats are bare. If you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Excuse me. So the two girls walk over to the table where the two fellas are sitting with the two bare seats, and they ask the two fellas politely, are the two bare seats occupied? But the fellas go on eating and don't even answer. Well, those two girls are dolls. And the two men are guys. They're slobs. <laughs> but if they, if they invited the girls to have dinner with them, would, would they be guys? Well, if it's Dutch treat, they're guys. But if the guys paid for the girls' dinners? Oh, well, those guys would be dolls. <laughs> so those are the kind of people that are in your show, guys and dolls. Would, uh, would I fit into your show? Well, if you were in our show, we'd have to call it Guys and Darlings. <laughs> well, Vivian, although your explanation was confusing, I must admit it was quite dull. <laughs> Likewise, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's get back to Margaret O'Brien and the part of Juliet. Vivian, have you seen Juliet? Mm, not since the show opened. I've been meaning to call her, but I've been so busy. <laughs> Vivian, dear, Juliet has been dead for years. No kidding! Now, I'm really sorry I didn't call her. You know, a patient should never put off till tomorrow. Uh, yes, but... well, we all have to go sometime. <laughs> Sammy, Sam Levine, come over here. I want you to watch this, too. What's the pitch? Margaret O'Brien and Jose Ferrer are doing a scene from Romeo and Juliet. And for this, you broke up my pinochle game. <laughs> but, Sam... It's that wonderful scene where Romeo meets Juliet on the balcony. A very good place to meet a doll. I met more dolls in the balcony of Lois Pitkin Theatre than... This... <laughs> this balcony happens to be Lois Verona. And, Ken Murray, wait a minute. Now, where are you sneaking off to? Aren't you interested in Romeo and Juliet? Oh, sure. I'm smoking one now. <laughs> I'm talking about Jose Ferrer. That's a good cigar, too. <laughs> I mean Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Oh, yes, Tallulah, I'm sorry. I know it very well. Oh, did you ever play Romeo and Juliet? Oh, sure. How did you do? Ran second, paid sixteen eighty to play. Gloria <laughs> <laughs> Swanson, Fran Warren, let's listen to Jose Ferrar play Romeo to Margaret O'Brien's Juliet. Go ahead, Jose. Well, Margaret, are you familiar with the lines of the scene? Oh, yes. We kids on the lot used to play Romeo and Juliet all the time. I'll bet that Lionel Barrymore kid must have made a great Romeo. Well, now, why don't we try a few lines from the scene that begins, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? Do you remember? Oh, yes. But soft. What light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Ah, me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel. For thou art as glorious to this night, being o'er my head, as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white, upturned, wandering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lacy, pacing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Oh, if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. 
know what's Montague. It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Or be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. And Romeo, doff thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth I never will be Romeo. What man art thou that thus be screened in night, so stumblest on my counsel? By a name I know not how to tell thee who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word. My ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering. Yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? Neither, fair maid, if either thee dislike. How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? The orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. With love's light wings did I o'erperch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do, that dares love attempt. Therefore thy kinsmen are no let to me. It is almost morning. I would have thee gone. And yet, no farther than a wanton's bird who lets it hop a little from her hand and with a silk thread plucks it back again, so loving, jealous of his liberty. I would I were thy bird. Sweet, so would I. Yet, I could kill thee with much cherishing. Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow. And I shall say good night till it be morrow. Thank you, darlings. And Jose, your little contribution was, as usual, divine. <laughs> Isn't he sweet? Just a minute, kid. I wouldn't bow that low if I were you. Your rubber panties are showing. But Tallulah, I was only acknowledging the plaudits of the multitude. I wish I had time to get to the famous death scene. That might be arranged, darling. <laughs> If you'll give me a moment to go out and get a little something, I'd like to see you do the poison drinking scene. Oh, would you enjoy that, Tallulah? Uh, to the dregs, dear. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you picking on the kids for? I think she's done real good. You think she done real good? I think she did real good. All right, did real good. The little, the little doll's got class. But Sam, darling, the role of Juliet should be played by an actress who has had much more experience than Margaret has had. She's so young. All right, I'll give you that. She ain't no Irene did. <laughs> Irene done. Well, make up your mind. <laughs> Juliet requires such a depth of perception, such inner fire. Oh, Margaret did very well indeed, but of course you can't, uh, well, you can't expect a child to have the third dimension that I have. Well, it's as broad as it's long. <laughs> Personally, I think she made a fine Juliet. I'd like to hear you do it better. I was wondering when you'd stop ad-libbing and get to that line. <laughs> I'll show you a side of Juliet you never saw before. From a balcony? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, darling? <laughs> Here I am, Julie, right under the fire escape. 
Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Refuse my name? All right, so I'm Jessica Dragonette. <laughs> oh, Stan, will you stop that? Don't you know the romantic story of Romeo and Juliet? Well, let me put it this way. No. You mean that you never heard of Romeo and Juliet? So kill me, I never heard of it. Samuel, you're in the theater. Where have you been all these years? Uh, three man on a horse, room service, light up the sky, and now I'm in Guys and Dolls. But this Shakespeare, I don't dig already. So don't dig it. Let him lay there already. Right. <laughs> and I'll tell you the story of Romeo and Juliet, or as you would call it, a guy and a doll. And this guy, Romeo, comes from a wealthy family, the Montagues. They're in the woolen business. Nice business, legit. Yeah. yeah. And the Dawes family is well-heeled, too. Mm -hmm. The Capulets. They operate a chain of flower stores. Now, that's how she knows that a rose by another name still, if you'll pardon the expression, smells. Mm. <laughs> well, that figures. And from the flower shops, they make money? Uh, so, all right. So, all right. They do a little bookmaking in back of the store. <laughs> well, that's... So the guy and the doll, they got a yen for each other. But the families object. Uh huh. Before they married, they already got mother in law trouble. Uh. No, it ain't the mother in laws, it's the fathers. You see, the old man in Montague, he's in the woolen business. And old man Capulet is in the flower business. So where's the competition? The Montagues make suits without buttonholes in the lapels. And it's ruining the Capulet flower business. Oh. <laughs> what a lousy trick. The guy and the doll want to get married, so they elope. And later the doll's father don't know she's married, so he wants her to marry another guy. So the doll lays down on the bed and, and makes it look like she's dead. And Romeo finds and thinks she is dead, so he kills himself. Oh. And when the doll wakes up and she finds the guy has knocked himself off, so the doll knocks herself off. Well, that's the finish of the play. That's the finish? <laughs> that is the finish. Well, I don't know. You don't know what. If they got some big hit songs, it's got a chance. <laughs> What's the name of that play again? Death of a Woolen Salesman. <laughs> what difference does it make? You wouldn't understand if I spent the rest of this year explaining it to you. And there isn't much left of this year. 1950 is almost over. And in a few hours, it'll be 1951. A new year. I don't know where the time goes. It seems there should be another month in the year to do all the things we forgot to do. A month to remember what we forgot. October, November, December, remember. <laughs> it even rhymes, doesn't it, darlings? A whole month of days to remember a kindly deed we should have done, a soft word we could have spoken. A friendly smile we should have restored. <sighs> Jose, what do you think? Well, I think that your month of remember should have at least 31 days. We could all use 31 days of grace devoted to undoing some of the unthinking things we did during the year. Well said, Jose, and I, I think we can carry the, the idea further and make it a month for the whole world to stop and remember what a wonderful place this could be to live in if man would really be brother to man. You're so right, Gloria. If the grown-ups would only take this month to remember, not to forget that the world they're making today is a world the kids of my age are going to have to live in tomorrow. Margaret, that's a beautiful pitch. Every grifter on Broadway, every crumb on every street corner, every tin horn on 42nd Street, if we could only give them an extra month to remember, they might have less to, f to try to forget when they go to sleep at night. Yes, Sam. And with this extra month of remember, what a chance it would be for the guys and dolls on Broadway and in Hollywood to remember that there's a real world outside the little dream world they live in. You're so right, Vivian. I sure could use that extra month just to sit around and... Remember all the kind and unselfish people who helped me up a few rungs of that long, rough ladder. Fran, that's a beautiful sentiment. You know, 
I didn't think too kindly about this extra month at first. I got to thinking about the extra bills that would come in on the 1st of Remember and the income tax on Remember the 15th. But believe me, give me that extra month to remember some of the things I could have done better in the 12 months we've had, and I'll pay those extra bills. Ken, you're right. But, Tallulah, you know what I would do if we could make this a universal month? I'd spend every one of the days talking to people everywhere in the world in the universal language, music. Then tell the world, Meredith, with some of the new and lovely words of that universal language. Some of the great songs from some of the great shows of the year pass by. It's the big show medley of the big shows of 1950, opening with one of the newest and gayest from the most recent of musical hits, Meredith Wilson, the big show orchestra and chorus in Guys and Dolls. <laughs> South Pacific, Vivian Blaine sings. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair and send him on his way. I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms. I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms. I'm gonna wave that man right out of my arms and send him Don't try to patch it up, tear it up, tear it up. Wash them out, dry them out, push them out, dry them out. Cancel him and let him go. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair and send him on his show chorus and orchestra in Meredith's arrangement of Irving Berlin's smash hit from Call Me Madam. Put your head on my shoulder, you need someone who's older, a rub down with a velvet glove. sings another great 1950 hit. Here's one of the best from Kiss Me Kate. Strange 
Don't stop the music, Meredith. You haven't heard yet from Tallulah. Here it is, darlings, my big song of 1950. Give my regards to Broadway. Remember me to Herald Square. and say that I'll be there along. <laughs> oh, thank you, darlings. Thank you, darlings. And now I think it would be very nice if the orchestra and all the cast and everybody would sing Old Lang Syne. But, Miss Bankhead, we already did that. You see, nobody ever tells me anything on this program. <laughs> oh, well, darlings, this winds up our New Year's show. And we ask you to be with us at this time next week when our stars will be Fred Allen, Marlena Dietrich, Portland Hoffer, Edward G. Robinson, 
Danny Thomas, Fran Warren, and others, and of course, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Fran? May you find that long awaited golden day today. Jose? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten. Vivian? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Sam? May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. Meredith? May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Margaret? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. Gloria? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Ken. May you walk with the sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. May there be a silver lining Back of every cloud you see. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. Happy New Year, darlings. Listen to the big show next Sunday when we'll have with us Fred Allen, Marlena Dietrich, Portland Hoffa, Edward G. Robinson, Danny Thomas, Fran Warren, Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus, and others. And, of course, as always, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. 20th Century was written by Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur, based on a play by Bruce Charles Mulholland, and adapted for radio by Frank Wilson. The Big Show is directed and produced by D. Engelbach, and written by Goodman Ace, with George Foster and Mort Green. Now, Phil and Alice, later here at Theater Guild State Fair on NBC.